the Roman legions with which ancient Rome conquered the Mediterranean, world underwent many changes over the centuries, originally they were dense phalanxes that fought with spears like ancient Greek hoplites. Hard experience and a series of bitter wars led to their transformation into the classic legions, whose men carried a squared curved shield and wielded a short sword, the gladius. Below are 20 things about that and other fascinating Roman history facts. The Roman Legion's Structure The Legion was the Roman army's largest military unit, and it underwent a series of changes in its centuries-long existence. In the mid-Roman Republic, it numbered about 3,000 heavy infantry divided into maniples of 120 soldiers, each comprised of two 60-man centuries. There were also 1,200 skirmishers and 300 cavalry, for a total of around 4,500 legionaries. In the late Republic, the centuries were enlarged to 80 men, and six centuries were grouped into a cohort of 480 men. A legion contained nine such standard cohorts, plus a first cohort of the best soldiers, made of five double-strength centuries of 160 men each, for a total nominal legion strength of 5,120 men, in practice about 4,500 men was the norm. In the early Roman Empire, Augustus retained 30 legions, stationed along the borders. They were supported by auxiliary troops of non-Roman citizens, who were granted citizenship at the end of their service. Each legion was led by a legate, usually a senator appointed by the emperor, beneath him were six tribunes, one from the senatorial class who served, as the legion's second in command, and five from the lower equestrian class. Third in command was the camp prefect, usually a veteran ranker from the lower classes. He had typically served 25 years, including a stint as centurion of the first cohort. Next came centurions officers promoted from the ranks to command the legion centuries and cohorts. Beneath them came optios, equivalent to first sergeants, one for each century, assisted by guard commanders, one per optio and the common legionaries. The birth of the flexible legion and the sword-wielding legionary the Romans originally fought with spears in dense phalanx formations, they switched to a more spread-out legion with sword-wielding legionaries because of the Samnite Wars, fought from 343 to 290 BC. Their Samnite enemies inhabited the Apennine Mountains south of Rome, and in that rough mountainous terrain, the dense phalanx proved to be unwieldy. By contrast, the Samnites were armed with swords and fought in flexible formations, with smaller subunits known as maniples, handfuls. They ran rings around the Romans, and dealt them a series of defeats, that culminated in the surrender of an entire Roman army at the Caudine Forks in 321 BC. The Romans were a pragmatic lot, and often copied from others what worked, so they abandoned the phalanx and adopted the manipular system around 315 BC, and legions were broken into heavy infantry maniples of 120 men, and three ranks of 40 men. Maniples were arrayed in three layers, based on experience and wealth, until the late 2nd century BC, Roman soldiers paid for their own equipment. In front of them were the vlites or skirmishers, often the youngest and nimblest. The first heavy infantry line were the hastidi, armed with short swords, a squared shield, the scutum, and throwing spears, the pila, then came the prince, prosperous men in the prime of their lives, who could afford decent equipment. Finally came the triari, the oldest and often wealthiest men, who could afford the best equipment. Armed with spears, they formed the last battle line, they were seldom used, battles were usually won by the soldiers ahead of them. They were only committed if things went wrong, and it has come to the triari became a common Roman phrase to mean the need to use one's last resort. The professionalization of the legions played a key role in the demise of the Roman Republic. Legions used maniples for over two centuries until they were replaced by larger cohorts of 480 soldiers in the Marian reforms of Gaius Marius, 157-86 BC. Germanic tribes had crossed the Alps, entered southern Gaul, threatened Italy, and wiped out two Roman armies sent to meet them. That through the Italian peninsula, always fearful of barbarians since Gauls had sacked Rome and devastated Italy in 387 BC into a panic. To meet the crisis, Marius opened the Roman legion's ranks, hitherto restricted to propertied citizens who could afford to arm and equip themselves, to all citizens including the poorest. The Roman government now furnished their weapons and armor, and paid them salaries. The army's character was transformed from a middle-class and patrician institution into a professional force for whose legionaries' military service became a career. The soldiers came to look upon their generals, not the government in Rome, for rewards during service, and for severance pay and retirement benefits when they were discharged. 
unscrupulous generals took advantage of that, and used legions more loyal to their commanders than to the state against Rome. The result was a chaotic century of civil wars that finally ended with the collapse of the Roman Republic and its replacement with the Roman Empire. One of Augustus' first acts when he consolidated power was to further professionalize the legions and break the legionaries' dependence on his general. Enlistment terms were extended from 10 years to 25, pay was standardized, and the legionary was guaranteed a land grant, or cash payment at the end of his service. The legionary's oath of allegiance, the sacramentum, was also switched from the general to the emperor. Roman tenacity and persistence. The traits that did the most to win their Romans their empire were military discipline, and tenacity and persistence in war, not so much military genius, the Romans conquered many enemies, who had great generals, with the Carthaginians and the brilliant Hannibal as prime examples. The Roman state excelled in its ability to marshal its resources, go after its foes relentlessly, get on with the job, and stick to the task stubbornly without cease, or let up until the enemy was ground down into submission. An example was Rome's systematic conquest of the Iberian Peninsula, a process begun in 220 BC, and that lasted over two centuries until its completion in 19 BC. That tenacity gave rise to one of history's most chilling rejoinders, uttered in the midst of the social war between Rome and her Italian allies. In that conflict Samnites, who had not forgotten their bitter wars against Rome from centuries ago, seized and fortified the town of Nola. Around 91 BC, a Roman army was sent to take it back, its commander went to parley with the rebels, but the talks broke down because the parties were unable to reach agreeable terms. As the Romans left, the Samnite leader taunted them with the boast that Nola would never surrender. Its fortifications were too powerful to storm, and the defenders could withstand a siege because they had enough supplies for ten years. The Roman commander's reply, as seen below, was epic. Then we shall take Nola in the eleventh year. The Samnites were famous for their stubbornness, and they seriously disliked the Romans, as evinced by the protracted wars they had fought against Rome, there was thus little reason to doubt that the Nola's Samnite defenders, would continue to fight unless the Romans improved their terms. However the Romans were even more stubborn. To the Samnite commanders taunt that Nola had enough supplies for ten years, the Roman commander replied then we shall take Nola in the eleventh year. He was in deadly earnest. The Roman general and future dictator Sulla was put in charge of the siege of Nola to keep it under tight siege, the social war ended in 88 BC, and the siege of Nola went on. A Roman civil war broke out between Sulla and Marius, and Sulla marched on Rome, leaving a legion behind to continue the siege of Nola. Sulla chased Marius out of Italy and executed some of his followers, then headed east to fight a war against King Mithridates of Pontus. The siege of Nola went on. The Marians came back, retook Rome and executed an even bigger batch of Sullans before Marius dropped dead. The siege of Nola went on. Then Sulla came back, retook Rome, made himself dictator, and subjected the Marians to a bloodbath that claimed thousands. All throughout, the siege of Nola, virtually forgotten by the outside world went on. Finally on the eleventh year of the siege in 80 BC, Nola's defenders ran out of supplies and were starved into surrender. The Roman Republic's Founder Lucius Junius Brutus, flourished 6th century BC, he was the legendary founder of the Roman Republic. He was also the ancestor of Marcus Junius Brutus who assassinated Julius Caesar, the dictator who ended the Republic. This early Brutus organized and led a rebellion that ousted Rome's last monarch, after which Brutus was elected to the new Republic's first consulship, Rome's highest office. Rome had been ruled by kings until 509 BC, when the king's son Sextus Tarquinus assaulted a noblewoman named Lucretia. Tradition has it that to preserve the family's honor, Lucretia told all the family members and gathered Romans, then stabbed herself to death, until then Brutus, a nephew of the king, had given little sign of potential greatness, Brutus is Latin for dullard. He had his own grievances against the king, who had executed Brutus' brother, and it is possible that he acted the dimwit to avert his uncle's suspicions. Whatever the case, that all changed on the day of Lucretia's death. A rebel with a cause Lucius Junius Brutus pulled the knife out of Lucretia's breast, waved the bloody blade around to stir up the public, vowed revenge against her assailant and the royal family, and led a popular revolt. By 507 BC the monarchy was done with, and Rome had become a republic. With Brutus its first chief magistrate, 
he epitomized the ideal of devotion to duty and severe impartiality in its fulfillment, he condemned his own sons to death, when they joined a conspiracy to restore the kings. Tradition holds that Brutus was killed in a battle against a royal army, in single combat with the son of the king he had ousted, he established many of the basic institutions of the Roman Republic, which lasted for half a millennium before it collapsed and was done away with by Julius Caesar and Augustus. Many of Brutus' Republican institutions continued for centuries more, in altered and reduced form, as emperors strove to at least pay lip service to the Republican facade. Roman dads had life and death power over their kids. The patriarchy today is nowhere near as powerful as it was in the days of ancient Rome. The degree of authority that a Roman head of household, or paterfamilias, exercised over the family would shock modern sensibilities. At the lower end of the spectrum, Roman law and tradition granted the family patriarch the power to reject or approve the marriages of his sons and daughters. At the more extreme end, those laws and traditions granted patriarchs a literal power of life and death over family members. In some instances, such as when it came to deformed babies, Roman law ordered patriarchs to kill infants with obvious deformities. Roman fathers also had the legal right to sell their children into slavery, it was not done often, and typically happened only in dire circumstances when hard-pressed patriarchs sought to ease their burdens. While the practice was not widespread, it did take place from time to time. However and for what it was worth for the kids, a father's right to sell his children was not absolute. He could only do so a maximum of three times, assuming the kids regained their freedom after each occurrence, before the thrice-enslaved kids were deemed forever free from his authority. The First Bad Roman Dictator Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix, commonly known as Sulla, was a successful Roman general and statesman, who came to head the Optimates, Rome's conservative and aristocratic political faction, in an ominous precedent, he used his legions to seize power in Rome and win the resultant civil war against the Populares a political faction that supported the plebeians, were commoners against the conservative aristocratic patricians. He then had himself appointed dictator, and massacred his political opponents by the thousands. As dictator, Sulla carried out constitutional reforms that were intended, but ultimately failed to strengthen the Roman Republic in its final decades. He came from an old patrician family, that was centuries removed from its heyday by the time he was born. He grew up dissolute and debauched, and consorted with actors a despised profession in those days. Strikingly handsome, he earned his keep by the seduction of wealthy older women, upon whom he preyed. At least two of his older sugar mamas died in mysterious circumstances, after they had designated Sulla the sole heir in their wills. Sulla's March on Rome Sulla used the inheritances from his older lovers to fund his political career, which he kicked off in 107 as Gaius Marius Quester, or financial magistrate, in the Numidian War. He captured the Numidian king Jugurtha by treachery and claimed credit for the victorious conclusion of the war, which aroused Marius' resentment. When the social war broke out against Rome's Italian allies, who demanded Roman citizenship and equal rights, Sulla performed brilliantly. His erstwhile commander Marius, aged and in poor health by then, did not. Sulla was elected consul in 88 BC, and given command of a war against King Mithridates of Pontus, Marius engineered the enactment of a law that stripped the command from Sulla, and gave it to Marius instead. In response, Sulla informed his legions that if Marius was commander, he would use his own legions and not Sulla's men. That would deprive them of the opportunity for the rich rewards they had expected in the form of booty, from a successful war against Pontus. With their financial interests threatened, the legions supported Sulla when he marched on Rome to seize power. A Dangerous Roman Precedent Sulla was in charge of the siege of the Italian city of Nola, in the final stages of the social war, when he heard that command of the war against Mithridates had been transferred to Marius, at the head of five of six legions then under his command, Sulla marched on Rome. It was an unprecedented move, no Roman commander before then had ever crossed Rome's city limits, the Pomerium with his army. A dangerous example was set, as it became clear that Roman legions could be more loyal to their general than to Rome. Marius and his supporters put up a fight, but they were disorganized, few in numbers, no match for Sulla's veterans and were forced to flee Rome. With armed soldiers at his back, Sulla pushed through favorable legislation, regained command of the war against Pontus, declared the Marians enemies of the state, then marched to Pontus to fight Mithridates. When Sulla left, 
Marius returned to Rome at the head of his own army in 87 BC, had Sulla's laws reversed, executed about a dozen Sulla supporters, and was elected consul an unprecedented seventh time for 86 BC. His term was brief however and he died a mere 17 days into his consulship. A new kind of dictator. Sulla won the war against Pontus then returned to Rome, which he entered at the head of his army 82 BC, after he defeated the Marians, he undid all their legislations, introduced reactionary conservative constitutional reforms that solidified the power of the aristocracy, and weakened that of the middle classes, and got himself appointed dictator. The office of dictator was a legal one in Rome's constitution, bestowed in emergencies for a maximum term of six months. Until then Roman dictators had typically used their extraordinary powers to fight foreign enemies. Sulla was a new kind of dictator, one who used his extraordinary powers against domestic opponents, he proceeded to massacre the Marians and Populares by the thousands. He posted proscriptions, or lists that named enemies of the state who could be legally killed by anybody. The killer was rewarded with a share of the proscribed victim's property, upon the presentation of his head to Sulla's agents. Sulla finally resigned in 79 BC, retreated into private life and died a year later. Ancient Romans had flush toilets and public restrooms. The Minoans of ancient Crete developed toilets that could flush waste in the 2nd millennium BC for centuries, that remained a luxury available only to the elites, until an economic boom and the spread of prosperity in the 1st millennium BC allowed the introduction of flush toilets to middle-class houses. Before long some ancient Greek cities had large-scale latrines that were open to the general public. Those early public restrooms consisted of large rooms with bench seats, connected to a drainage system. It was the Romans, however, who made the most use of flush technology and public latrines in the ancient world. By the 1st century BC, many Roman houses had private flush toilets that were connected to the public drainage system, and public restrooms were common in cities and towns. They did not have private stalls, however. The facility consisted of a room lined with stone or wooden bench seats, with toilet openings over a sewer. Everybody of both genders did their business in front of everybody else. To clean themselves, they used reusable sponges on a stick. The sponges were cleaned between uses by dipping them into small gutters, with running water that flowed in front of the toilet seats. The Reformist Politician Sulla's bout of domestic political violence was the worst in the Roman Republic's history until then, but it was not the first. A generation earlier, Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, circa 164 to 133 BC, a Roman tribune of the plebes and a pro-commoner's popularis politician, met a violent end at the hands of Rome's conservative upper classes. His widowed mother Cornelia, who became known as Cornelia, mother of the Gracchi, was a daughter of Scipio Africanus, who had defeated Hannibal in the Second Punic War. She had refused a marriage proposal from King Ptolemy VIII to devote herself to her children. Tiberius' political platform revolved around public lands that had been steadily concentrated into illegal giant estates controlled by a small elite of the patrician senatorial class that threatened to extinguish the class of small independent farmers who had formed the backbone of the Roman military. Tiberius had served in the military as a young man, and he noticed that the legions faced a manpower crisis. Rome's legions were drawn from those who could afford to arm and equip themselves, mostly independent farmers. However, the class of independent farmers had drastically shrunk over a generation as public lands were illegally seized and consolidated into vast estates controlled by the patrician senatorial classes. In addition to illegality, it drove small farmers off their lands and into poverty and diminished the pool of prospective legionaries. Tiberius sponsored agrarian reform laws to redistribute those public lands from the elites to the commoners, and his efforts were met by a vicious backlash from the elites. The Roman Republic's first serious bout of domestic political violence. Tiberius Gracchus proposed agrarian reforms to break the giant estates illegally seized by the elites from public lands and redistribute them in small parcels to lower class citizens. In order to restore the independent yeoman class, he was vehemently opposed by the Rome's elites. When he nonetheless pushed through legislation that began to redistribute the land, he was murdered by a senatorial mob in a riot organized by Optimates. That was the name of a faction of conservatives, who sought to limit the power of the popular assemblies and the tribunes, and extend that of the pro-aristocratic senate. It was the Roman Republic's first act of organized political violence. That broke two taboos, 
one against political violence in general, and one against violence against the tribune of the plebes, whose persons had been deemed sacrosanct and inviolate for centuries, violence begat violence and Tiberius Gracchus' political murder ushered in nearly a century of turmoil, as the Roman Republic tore itself apart in bouts of civil wars and bloody political purges. In a historic irony, the violence fell disproportionately upon, and virtually wiped out the very patrician and senatorial class whose interests the optimates sought to advance. A young reformer who followed in his brother's footsteps. Tiberius Gracchus' reformist torch was picked by his younger brother Gaius Sempronius Gracchus, 154 to 121 BC, a decade younger than Tiberius. Gaius was influenced by his brother's reform policies and his murder at the hands of a senatorial mob, and followed in his footsteps. He became a tribune of the plebes, a popularis politician who advanced the cause of the plebeians, and an advocate of agrarian reform. He also followed in Tiberius' footsteps as a victim of political violence when the conservative Roman Senate and the Optimates murdered him. Elected a tribune of the plebes in 123 BC, Gaius Gracchus made innovative use of the popular assemblies to push through legislation to reenact his brother's agrarian reforms. He also advocated other measures to lessen the power of the senatorial nobility. Gaius also pushed through legislation to provide all Romans with subsidized wheat and was re elected tribune in 122 BC. In 121 BC, the Senate and the Roman conservative elites once again turned to political violence and organized a riot to go after a tribune. Roman conservative elites initiated bouts of political violence that came back and exterminated their class. After one of his supporters was killed by Roman conservatives, Gaius Gracchus and his followers retreated to the Aventine Hill, the traditional asylum of plebeians in an earlier age. In response, the Senate enacted a novel decree that ordered the consuls to go after Gaius, which they did with a mob. When he saw that all was lost, Gaius committed suicide, while the mob fell upon and massacred hundreds of his followers, then threw their bodies into the Tiber River. In the long run, the political murders of the Gracchi brothers backfired upon the Optimates' cause and the patrician senatorial class whose interests they sought to advance. The patricians were virtually exterminated in rounds of proscriptions that killed members of their class and confiscated the properties. First the dictator Sulla went after the Populares after his victory in Rome's first civil war. Then the pendulum swung a generation later, when Octavian and Mark Antony went, after the Optimates in an even bloodier and more thorough proscription, after their victory in a civil war against Julius Caesar's assassins, what relatively few patricians survived were gradually killed off later as they were caught up in, or were falsely accused of conspiracies against various emperors. By the end of the first century AD, the patrician class was virtually extinct. Roman fathers could kill their promiscuous daughters and their lovers. A Roman patriarch's power of life and death over family members was particularly evident when it came to his authority over the family's women, despite the Romans' reputation for licentiousness, debauchery, and wild orgies. They indulged in such carnal excesses even as they viewed adultery as a serious matter not just on moral grounds, but also because it introduced the possibility of illegitimate heirs to a pater familias estate. When Augustus became emperor, he sought to restore traditional values with a slate of morality laws aimed against adultery, defined as physical intimacy between a woman and man who was not her husband. However, physical relations with female slaves and prostitutes did not count. One of Augustus' morality laws, enacted in 18 BC, codified a father's traditional rights, if somebody engaged in adultery with his daughter, the father could legally kill the lover as well as his daughter, whether in his own house or in the house of his son-in-law. Ironically, Augustus' own daughter, Julia the Elder, ran afoul of those anti-adultery laws. He did not kill her, but to save face, exiled her in 2 BC first to a small island, then to a tiny village in the toe of Italy. She remained in exile for the rest of her life. In A.D. Augustus' granddaughter, Julia the Younger, also got caught up in an adultery scandal with a Roman senator. He had her exiled to a remote island, where she gave birth to a love child. Augustus ordered the infant exposed. Ancient Romans washed their mouths with pee. The Roman poet Catullus once directed an insult at a man named Ignatius, whose smile the poet disliked. It illustrates an odd fact about Romans' day-to-day -day lives. They cleaned their mouths with pee. As the poet put it in his put-down, there's nothing more foolish than foolishly smiling. Now you're Spanish in the country of Spain what each man pisses, 
he's used to brushing his teeth and red gums with, every morning so the fact that your teeth, are so polished just shows you're more full of piss. The insult about an abnormal practice was that Ignatius smiled too much, which was bad because smiles were presumably worthless, the diss was not that he washed his mouth with urine, that part was perfectly normal in ancient Rome. Urine's active ingredient is ammonia, which the body secretes in the form of urea. Today we use ammonia in many things, from explosives to cleaning products to agricultural fertilizers. Not only will ammonia remove stubborn stains from your bathtub and oven, it will also give your dishes and glasses an impressive twinkle. P was big business in ancient Rome. Nowadays, we extract ammonia with chemical processes that do not rely on pee. Ancient Romans did not have modern science, but they still understood the benefits of ammonia. So they got it from the most readily available source back then, urine. Not only did ancient Romans use it to clean their mouths, they also put it to a variety of other uses. The laundry trade, for example, relied heavily on stale urine. In giant public laundries known as Folonica, dirty clothes were placed in vats, where they were soaked in stale pee. Then workers usually slaves stomped on them until the stains came out. Other industries such as tanneries and agriculture, used not only urine but urine mixed with feces. Urine was so important in ancient Romans' daily lives and their economy, that pea collection was a big business. As a result public chamber pots, or big vats where anybody could stop and take a piss, were commonplace. In addition to dental hygiene, industrial and commercial uses, Romans also used pee for medicinal purposes. Pliny the Elder, for example, praised stale urine's effectiveness in the treatment of diaper rashes. He also wrote that fresh urine could treat sores, burns, infections of the anus, chaps, and scorpion stings.